What's the message? <laughs> what is the message? Of course, this is talking about the message of salvation brought by Jesus. Now, if you ask most anybody in this country what God did for sinners, the greatest majority will at least mention the name Jesus. They may not know the full story. They may not have the full context or understanding uh, of what's going on. But most will be familiar with the premise of Jesus. But you'll find that very few can give a good explanation of how that man, Jesus, and what he did applies to our own lives in a meaningful way. Now, sadly, even among believers, the phrase, Jesus died for our sins, has simply become a statement of faith with no real understanding of the spiritual implications. The best explanation I've heard is from Ray Comfort, a minister from New Zealand who has been reaching out to souls on the streets of California for over 30 years. He describes the message this way. Now imagine you're in court with piles of unpaid violations, traffic violations. The judge says, since you're unable to pay these massive fines, I'm sentencing you to the maximum prison term. You have no power to do anything but accept your guilty verdict. Suddenly, a stranger comes into the courtroom and tells the judge, I'll pay his fines. Now, even though you are guilty, the judge can legally release you because your debt has been paid. Now, I believe this is, this is what he said, but I believe that this is an accurate description of the death of Jesus for our sins. It was a legal transaction. He came along and paid that debt that we had no power to pay. <clears throat> we all deserve death and hell for our sins, regardless of how good we've been, or uh, i got to pick on Sister Sutton again, how young we got saved, we all would have gone to hell were it not for the blood of Jesus and salvation. But Jesus did come to make a way to escape. All we have to do is accept his payment on our behalf. Now, in that analogy of salvation with the judge, the guilty party is not required to accept the payment of his fines by this merciful stranger. He can simply tell the judge, no, I don't accept this generos generosity. I will take the time that I've been sentenced to serve. It's also just as important to remember that if we do accept the stranger's generosity, it will only cover those fines which we, have, we had previously brought upon ourselves. His financial sacrifice does not grant us license to go out and commit further traffic violations without fear of future judgment. What did, Je what did Jesus say to the woman who was caught in the act of adultery? He said, go and sin no more. <clears throat> her debt was paid, but her future remained in her own hands by the choices that she would make after that point. This fact is made clear elsewhere in the New Testament, but I'm only going to bring uh, mention one other passage of Scripture here. This is one of the most clear and concise passages I know on this subject. 1 John 3, 6 through 8, Whosoever abideth in him, that is God, sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he, that's God, is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, if we're truly in Jesus, we will not sin, according to verse 6. As a matter of fact, it goes on to say that we don't even know Jesus. If we continue in sin, <clears throat> verse 8 informs us of who we are serving when we sin. Then John <clears throat> reminds us that Jesus did not come to make sin acceptable. He came to destroy the works of the devil or to do away with them completely in the heart of the believer. Now, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, this analogy of the judge and do you have any thoughts on that? 
No? All righty then. Let's move on. Before Jesus fulfilled the law by by becoming our sinless sacrifice, being religious was hard work. Jews who followed the law closely had to keep a tight outward control of their eating habits, dress, and cleanliness, whether they were doing it for the love of God or for the love of men's admiration. There was virtually no aspect of life for which there was not a rule from God or more often from the scribes. Excuse me. Sorry. The Pharisees specifically provided the, prided themselves in keeping even the smallest of rules, such as tithing spices. Jesus had another way. He did not do away with the rules but his method of living them was based on a relationship with God, not with following a spiritual to-do list. Uh, There is a difference. There's there's a huge difference in surrendering to the will of God, which is what we are called to do as Christians, not as Church of God members. As Christians, we are called to surrender to the will of God. And when we allow the Spirit of God in our lives, he will guide and direct us, and we don't need the list. The list is just guidelines until we come to that place where God has the freedom to work through us. Those things automatically come because we're surrendered to God. When we love God, I don't want to do this because it would hurt Him. What has He done for me? All the things that He's done for me, I don't want to do anything to hurt Him. I love my wife more than anything. I wouldn't do anything to hurt her. And, and there are things I could, I could leave my stuff laying around the house and, and just make a mess everywhere I go and expect her to clean it up because she's my wife and that's what she does. I don't, I, that's not love. But I clean up. I try to pick up my messes. I try to help around the house and do things that are beneficial because I love her. Not because I don't want her mad at me. That's following a list of rules. But because I love her, these things are things that I automatically do. I don't think about it and say, well... I'd really love to lay this, leave this stuff laying here, but it's going to make Wendy mad, so I don't want to make Wendy mad, so I'm going to go ahead and pick it up. You know, it would really make Wendy happy if I picked this stuff up, and this is her mess. It doesn't matter. I think this would make her happy. This, this just needs to be done. It's not my responsibility, but it needs to be done. I'm going to do it because I love her, and I want her to be happy because she's my wife. When we love God, those are the thoughts that we have. I, Thank you, Lord, for giving me this opportunity. Help me to understand what it is that pleases you so that I can serve you faithfully. Now, the Pharisees, including Paul before his conversion, were very proud of their faithfulness in following even the most minute aspects of the Levitical law. But they had had totally missed the spirit of the law as well as the one who gave it. The law was not given to show the people how good they could be. It was supplied to reveal our inability to follow the law faithfully, apart from the power of God working through us. Somehow this concept escaped the Jews and their zeal to be glorified for their own behavior. It is a fact that no stream can flow higher than its source. This clearly applies to the spiritual matters as well. Just as much as the Pharisees were known for their adherence to the letter of the law, the Sadducees were known for ignoring the laws. These two opposing factions clearly represent the legalist and liberal in the so-called Christian world today. Both viewpoints are clearly and completely wrong according to Jesus. The main character that arises from this is division. When the leadership is divided, the membership will always follow suit. This tactic of the devil has been effective throughout the years since Jesus walked the earth. Sadly, those who succumb to this attack are rarely aware of it, nor are they aware of the great damage it inflicts by hindering the spreading of the gospel. Jesus prayed just before he and his disciples went to Gethsemane in John chapter 17. In verse 21 of that prayer, He said, Jesus said, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now, 
That's some serious unity that Jesus is talking about here. How much greater unity can exist than that which exists among the Godhead? Not only did he pray for the perfect unity of believers, he declared that the critical nature of the reason for the unity. Why should there be perfect unity among Christians? Jesus says that the world may believe that thou, God, hast sent me. Our unity declares the truth of the gospel message. We're talking about the gospel message here. But sadly, our division also declares its falsehood. This fact was so important that Jesus repeated the words in verse 23 in, in, in different words. This fact he repeated in different words. That I and them and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one. That the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. This is the power of unity in the gospel message. And it's also the power of division to sabotage the message of Christ. Looking around us today, is it any wonder that the lost question the sincerity of believers of the seriousness of the message of Christ? We understand the truth, but, or the distinction between truth and error. We recognize the apostate organizations who, unknow who unknowingly serve the enemy of our souls. But those who are on the outside... They don't see those distinctions. They don't see those differences. All they see is division. This is all the more reason for us to be unified in everything concerning God's work in the church. When the love of God flows freely through us and not the spirit of division, people will begin to take notice. And the message of God's love will become more effective among the lost. Now back in the commentary, Jesus' whole ministry was involved. Jesus' whole ministry involved helping people understand how simple it really is to please God, summed up by two commandments. Love God with everything you have, and love your neighbor the way you love yourself. <clears throat> Excuse me. This simple message covers all of what the church is commissioned, commissioned to preach to the world. Now, how can all of God's will for his people be summed up in two simple laws? It's quite easy. If you truly love God, you will only do those things that are pleasing to him. That means your life will line up with every Bible truth and every doctrine, <clears throat> clearly and simply. Loving God includes not setting up false gods, which in this day are not golden statues, but they can be anything which steals our time and attention from God. A quick way to see if you have a false God set up in your heart. If you come to the end of the day and you realize that you haven't spent much, if any, time in worship, prayer, or in God's Word, whatever it was that you did instead of those things, that's a God, and it's hindering your relationship with the one true God. And if you truly love your neighbor, you will not do anything to hurt him, but you will be a blessing to him in anything that you do. You won't talk badly about him or steal from him or hurt him or desire his stuff, but you will help and encourage him in any way that you can. These two laws Jesus gives cover every aspect of faithful Christian living. But we still can't do it properly apart from salvation and the Holy Ghost working in us at all times. <clears throat> Golden truth, <clears throat> excuse me, Golden Truth, Romans 10 and 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Commentary, part one, a simple message. Mark 16 and 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. James 1.27 Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now, although some Christians make serving God seem very difficult, salvation 
is not a com complicated concept. The basis of the gospel, which Jesus commanded us to preach to every creature, is that God's sinless son died to pay the debt for our sins so that we, could, we can escape God's wrath and live with him forever. Now, salvation is not about making this life more comfortable. I can't help but repeat myself when I say, Jesus said, in this life ye shall have tribulation. Jesus didn't specify. He simply assured us that tribulation will be a part of this life as human beings. Paul backed Jesus up and went a step further when he said, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Both of these verses use the word shall. This word shall indicates a promise or a certainty. There is no doubt that these statements are true. And you don't have to live very long to experience these facts firsthand. But as true as they are, we also have the assurance of the eternal peace and joy in Jesus when we fully submit ourselves to him. This life is a vapor, but it will not be the sum total of our existence. Eternity awaits us all. Now is the time to choose where we're going to spend it. Back in the commentary here. This concept made so clear in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is something that most humans are capable of understanding. Read the Sermon on the Mount for further evidences of the Gospel's simplicity. I hope everybody's read the Sermon on the Mount. It's a lot of good stuff there. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told us, if you need something, ask God for it. If you have more than you need, share it with someone who, who, who needs it. James said, good work such as helping widows and orphans and avoiding those things of this world which would hinder our spiritual growth are some of the truest evidences of living godly lives. These daily needs of Christianity are the end result of a relationship with God. When we are truly born again, the Holy Spirit causes us to love God with everything we have and love others the way we love ourselves. When we bring this simple gospel to every creatures, excuse me, to every creature, sinners can be released from bondage into lives of spiritual freedom to serve the Lord. Now, before salvation, we had no power to do the things that were pleasing to God. We couldn't. Through Jesus, we gain the ability to cast off the works of darkness and move into the light of God. This is the freedom that we gain. We don't have the freedom to sin. We have the freedom to avoid sin. <laughs> we didn't have that freedom before, that we couldn't live without sin apart from Jesus. But now that Jesus has come into our hearts, he gives us that freedom to serve him. Paul puts it this way in Romans 7, 18 through 23. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity that captivity that we're to be freed from. Captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now, we should all be able to identify with this statement here. Before we came to salvation, we, we had no way, we could not do those things. We might be able to, okay, well, I'm going to not do this today. Then tomorrow it comes up and we don't even think about it. And it happens, we look back and say, oh, man, I wasn't supposed to do that. We're trying in our own strength and we don't have the ability. We don't have the freedom we are in bondage to sin without salvation. Paul understood the difference between good and evil. But he had no power to choose the good because he was bound by the flesh to Satan and his evil works. No matter how hard we try on our own, we can never live up to the perfect spirit of the law of God. We will always come up short. We may be able to put on a good show for a while, 
but it will only be temporary and external submission to the letter of the law. Within us, the corruption of the flesh still remains. It still reigns. We may not physically act on those evil impulses, but they still reside within our minds, out of the sight of others, but not of God. This is what Jesus was trying to get across in the Sermon on the Mount. In many ways, he said, the law says don't do it, but I say even the thought of such things are sinful. Paul gives us the answer to this dilemma in Romans 8, 1 through 5. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now many people want to stop there and say there is no condemnation in the, them who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, well then you can do whatever you want, because I'm in Christ Jesus, I can live as I like. But the rest of that verse says, who walk not after the flesh, who don't do those things that the flesh would cause us to do, but allow ourselves to be submitted to the Spirit so that the Spirit has control and we don't do those things anymore. Verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So that's our action. If, are we walking after the flesh or are we walking after the Spirit? We cannot walk after the Spirit without the Spirit of God dwelling in us. Verse 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. The flesh that is, the human mind has no power to defeat those sinful thoughts. But by the power of God working in us through our full submission to Him, He will work in us that which was once impossible on our own. Through Christ we have been granted the freedom to live according to the will of God and overcome the carnal nature or the human desire to participate in those things which we know are wrong. As a result, Paul points out in Romans 8, 12 through 15, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We have been set free to serve God inside and out by the power of the Spirit working in us. And it is clearly the Spirit of God working in us and not by our own strength or ability that this is accomplished. According to Jesus, we will be fully unaware of the good Spirit. According to Jesus, we will be fully unaware of the good the Spirit does through us. In Matthew 25, 31 through 40, I read part of this last week and read this other part this week. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hung and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, And as much as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. These were oblivious to the fact that they were even doing anything right. They never even noticed 
their faithfulness to assist the poor and needy souls who pass by them daily. They were so focused on their surrender to God, on their love of God in all things, that they never even realized that the Spirit was leading them to be blessings where they were needed most. May we ever be so faithful to surrender all that we have and all that we are to the will of God and to share the power of this truth with others. Part two, a more perfect way. Acts 18, 25 and 26. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. The gospel of Jesus Christ, crucified for man's sins, is the basis of missionary teaching for the many in the dom denominational world. The church of God has the added responsibility of preaching the full gospel to the whole world. And many denominational churches are not preaching the Bible experiences of sanctification as a definite work of grace or the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Denominational missionary efforts may also be guilty of not recognizing the fullness of the truth when it comes to teaching about covenant relationship with God and a single visible church as opposed to the invisible kingdom of God made up of all believers. The church of God essentially stands alone. Like the early saints Aquila and Priscilla did when they found a man who only knew part of the gospel, Church of God members of today must strive to tell the whole world the whole story. This is our great commission. The message of salvation is of the utmost importance to this fallen world. It's the doorway. It is the doorway to a life of peace and joy in whatever this world and the enemy of our souls can throw at us. Now, it may not take all the struggles out of life, but it will be much easier to endure the trials that we are all bound to face while we are here. When Jesus said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it, Matthew 7, 14. That straight, and, that straight gate or difficult point of entry, that was salvation. But after we enter the straight gate, then comes the narrow way. It's not just simply straight as the gate, it's straight as the gate and narrow as the way. Both are necessary for eventual entry into eternal life. Amen. Simply entering the gate is not the same as entering the pearly gates of heaven. There is often much life that we have to live between the two. This is where the narrow way comes in. Salvation is the first step on a journey. It is not the destination. <clears throat> Once we enter that gate, then we must continue to progress along that narrow way. <clears throat> when Jesus gave us that, the Great Commission, he didn't say, go out and get souls saved and, and that'll be all you have to do. I don't remember that in the Bible. I don't remember that in, in any version, any translation of the Bible. He didn't tell the people, he didn't say, tell the people what I did for them, and then they won't have to do anything else after that, but wait for death or the rapture. Once again, I don't recall any version of the Bible saying anything like this. He did say in Matthew 28 and 20, which is part of the Great Commission, teaching them to observe all things, all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now, we are responsible for teaching the all things part of this commission as well as salvation and baptism. Salvation and baptism are critical. But we must teach the all things as well. As I said in an earlier lesson, we are often saved, most often saved as a result of the fear of hell a personal, individual fear of hell. That fear of eternal torment opened the door. But by continuing in that same fear, many have fallen away because fear has a tendency to fade over time. That fear was important because it revealed our need for a Savior, for the Savior. Amen. But Christian maturity will transform that fear 
into a love and appreciation for what has been done for us to help us to escape from the flames of hell. As I said earlier, the way I, I, I do things around the house for Wendy and, and try to help her, when we love God, those same things will, will come out of that love that we have for, for Him. The Spirit empowers us and fills us with that same love. I want to do those things that please God because of what He's done for me. And because the Spirit works in, in me, it drives me, it pulls me in the direction of those things that serve to benefit others. And that's pleasing to God. Does it mean I'm perfect? No. But I, I'm striving for that mark of perfection like Paul says. <clears throat> this, is the only this is only possible that striving for it is only possible when we move forward along that narrow way. Moving from fear to love. From the fear, the dread, that, that dread of hell to that awesome reverent fear of God, that love that we should have for Him. This requires more than the initial salvation experience. It's a growing in our understanding of grace and our need to fully submit to the Spirit of God so that our lives will remain pleasing to God. Now, I'm not saying that salvation isn't enough to get you to heaven. I believe many have been saved and then died in the faith soon after. But if we move forward in this life along the narrow way, we will only do so by our faithfulness to continue to live our lives according to His will and by his power. The conclusion, every second of every day, people throughout the world are dying without Jesus in their hearts. Now, I had to stop right here in my study and do a little search because according to the most recent statistics that I've come across, over 150,000 people die each and every day. Now, just to give you an idea of what that means, I think we're all familiar with the city of Chattanooga. The population of Chattanooga is just over 150,000. Every day, the population of Chattanooga dies. They go out into eternity. Prepared or unprepared, they're gone. This should motivate us to get this message that this lesson's talking about out there. Now, I may not be able to reach 150,000 souls, but after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, a small handful of men and women reached the entire known world in a matter of a few years without the aid of modern transportation or communication. What are we doing with the message that we've been given? Oh, praise the Lord, we have our video ministry. We can at least get out to a few more people than we have inside these four walls. Now, back in the commentary, the Bible says that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It is the spiritual duty of every Christian, especially members of the body of Christ, the church of God, to reach the world with the message of the risen Savior who offers forgiveness from sin and who grants eternal life. The church of God must also discipline born-again Christian, disciple born-again Christians and let them know about sanctification, holy living, the baptism with the Holy Ghost, and the covenant relationship with God. Excuse me, among many other Bible teachings. Once again, Jesus said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Not just salvation, as important as it is, but all things. Section 1 of this lesson instructed us to read the Sermon on the Mount. In that sermon, you will find many of the things that Jesus instructs us to pass along to others. Salvation is about opening the door for us to serve God according to His will. And we will not be found faithful if we open the door and then choose to go our own way after that. We will not be received as God's children if we accept salvation and then walk according to our own personal choices. Jesus said in Luke 9, 62, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. We, be we can begin to serve him, but if we look back to the sins of our past with longing, Jesus says that we've already failed him. 
Our eyes must ever be facing forward into greater depths of his will and his ways for our lives. Anything less is an assault. It's an affront against his sovereignty, which will end in our own destruction. In the last paragraph, I have a couple of questions in this lesson. Ask yourself, do I, by a rigid religious lifestyle and conversation, turn people away from the simplicity of the gospel? Or do I, by careless words or deed, misrepresent the Bible's biblical standard of holiness? Do I need to ask Jesus to help me present him and his salvation in a more accurate way? <coughs> love, love is more than a word. And so many today think that love is simply a word. Love is a lifestyle. Love is, is a heart condition. Love is something that is visibly seen. It's, it's not simply heard. Love, I've heard love described as an action word. It's a word of action. And it's, in this situation, it's very clear that Sister Betty, uh, no, no, there's no love involved in there. There may be appreciation. There may be uh, uh, other things. There may be taking advantage of a situation, but that's, that's definitely not love. And that should be clear to us that we should understand that it's more than the words that we speak to God. And, and I know that I've, I've brought that out, and I, I, I know that that's something that personally God has dealt with me about. I, I sometimes have a hard time just shouting praise the Lord at the end of service, thinking, Lord, does my life say praise the Lord? Because if my life says, doesn't say praise the Lord, then I, I don't even have the right. I don't even have the right to sh speak the word because then, like Sister Betty, what you were saying, do I say, praise the Lord, don't do anything for him? Is my life, are the words that I speak to others praising the Lord? Is the life, the actions that I take, the things that I, the things that I do throughout my daily life, are they pleasing to the Lord? Because if the things that I'm doing aren't pleasing to the Lord, the words that I'm saying have absolutely no meaning, just like you said. God is good. By giving us this message, just simply by providing the message, he's done more for us than we deserve. By allowing us to understand that there is a message of hope.